The Silent Hill series is known for its unusual method of presenting psychological fears rather than the more realistic ones. Characterized as a survival horror, each title places the protagonist inside their own personal nightmare. In every game, you find yourself looking for someone. Now that could be your wife, your kid, brother, whatever. It doesn't really matter. In this situation, we're searching for Mary. This takes place in the title, Silent Hill 2. Now, I'm not necessarily going to be reviewing the game, but let's just say that I'm not the only one that thinks it's a pretty good game. See that? That's an IGN score. Not bad. For those who don't know, Silent Hill is actually a small abandoned town shrouded with fog and mystery. Despite it being a sequel, Silent Hill 2 doesn't directly connect with the original game that was released in 1999. So with a completely new cast of characters, the player assumes the role of James Sunderland, a guy who sort of represents the everyman complex. On surface level, he doesn't appear to have too much personality. Despite his somewhat reserved character, James is in search of his wife Mary, who is diagnosed with an unknown but terminal disease. Now even though James is convinced that his wife has been deceased for three years, the game starts out with James reading a letter with handwriting that's identical to Mary's. Though it sounds rationally impossible, he continues anyway. The letter says she is alive and waiting for him in their special place, in Silent Hill. Considering the town is where they had their honeymoon long ago, James believes there is still a chance. Now, we'll get back to that letter, but let it be known that there's a lot of substance to be taken from this game. But is there any rhetoric? Well, as a matter of fact, yes there is. So for those of you who aren't in Dr. Collins' class, or don't exactly pay attention, you're probably asking yourself, what is rhetoric, and how does it connect to this? Well, hopping on over to the land of the internet, Merriam-Webster defines it as language that's intended to influence people that may not be honest or reasonable. Simply put, rhetoric is the art or skill of persuasion or influence. Now hold on a minute, you might say. Doesn't rhetoric mean it has to be truthful? Well, no. Not at all, actually. As a matter of fact, if you've ever heard of the sophists, these teachers would practice something called false rhetoric. According to philosophers Plato and Aristotle, the sophists were not seeking the truth, but only victory in debate, and were prepared to use dishonest means to achieve it. That mysterious letter in itself could be an example of false rhetoric, come to think of it, right? Maybe. We'll get back to that. Throughout James's time in Silent Hill, you expose yourself to both true and false rhetoric. As you search for clues leading you closer to your wife Mary, you meet Maria. Now if you do a pretty close side-by-side -side comparison between the two, there's a pretty visible similarity. However, Maria is more outgoing, even described as a sexier, wilder version of Mary. I'm here for you, James. See? I'm real. The version of Mary. And it's true. Maria is actually James's reimagining of Mary. After she was struck with that unknown terminal illness, the relationship between Mary and James went downhill and overall just wasn't the same. There are mentions that James didn't enjoy his wife's company anymore as her condition had made her more and more ugly towards James. As a result of loneliness and even sexual frustration, the concept of Maria was then artificially created. Just like false rhetoric, she appears more so to James' emotions and is a character who's pretty ambiguous having little to no backstory in comparison to James's actual wife, Mary. So now that we know a little more about what's going on with Mary and how Marie is a pretty good example of false rhetoric, let's look into a way in which true rhetoric is used. Before the days of choose your own adventure video games, the Silent Hill series did something a little bit different. Now, with the choice of six different endings in the game, an interesting mechanic is used to determine how your game finishes. Now there isn't a good or bad ending, but the game uses reason to determine just how your game finishes up. It's in this situation where we realize that James has a little more going on than what we initially thought. See, the game looks into the decisions you've made as well as the small choices that you wouldn't expect to see being brought up. Let's take a knife for example. How about this one? It belongs to a suicidal character named Angela who James encounters at an apartment complex in the town. Although Angela easily has a story of her own, we'll concentrate just on her knife. 
Even though it's just a regular old knife, the suicidal tendencies from Angela get passed onto it. So if you look at your inventory and examine it, what happens? Well, nothing at first. You just find out that the blade is stained with something red. But hold on to that for just a minute. If you continue to examine the knife in your inventory, imagine what that would look like in reality. Are you catching on? Let's consider a few more choices, like deciding whether to keep your health up or not, looking at a photo of your wife Mary or her letter, the amount of time you choose to spend with Mary's spunkier version Maria, and whether you choose to listen to a critical recording where you have a deep conversation with your wife. On their own, they practically mean nothing. But if you gather all these factors along with a few others, the game actually uses this information to determine just what kind of ending you're bound to receive. I call this Subconscious Player Action Analysis, or SPA. These are actions you perform where you don't expect anyone to care or remember. See, in this situation, the game uses true rhetoric to make a decision. The game literally doesn't have any feelings. It's programmed. I myself can't use a false rhetorical device that has emotional appeal to determine what kind of ending I'll receive. No, this game uses the cold hard truths that come from the player's actions. And at the end of the day, the ending can really be considered a judgment to some extent. But yeah, look at the Phaedrus, Plato's conception of what true rhetoric really is. Its functions are designed to make men better citizens and to be responsible for punishment of the guilty. From there, real life affecting judgments are made based on evidence provided by the action of the player themselves. So you might be asking yourself, so what? Silent Hill isn't even real. Well, you're right. Come to think of it, Silent Hill isn't something I would consider real. It's almost a personal purgatory. But before we get into that, remember that letter from Mary? At the very end, we find out exactly what it says. Now, this is a pretty long letter, so if we use Burke's dramatic pen tad, we're able to sort of get a better idea of what Mary, the agent, is trying to communicate. So the purpose behind this letter, the agency, is to provide James with a clean conscience to live the rest of his life. The scene itself depends on the ending you unknowingly chose, and is once again based off your playstyle. That being said, the act itself is pretty powerful. Imagine reading this letter from someone who's special to you. Someone you wholeheartedly love. In my restless dreams, I see that town. Silent Hill. You promised you'd take me there again someday. But you never did. Well, I'm alone there now. In our special place. Waiting for you. Waiting for you to come to see me. But you never do. And so I wait. Wrapped in my cocoon of pain and loneliness. I know I've done a terrible thing to you. Something you'll never forgive me for. I wish I could change that, but I can't. I feel so pathetic and ugly laying here, waiting for you. Every day I stare up at the cracks in the ceiling, and all I can think about is how unfair it all is. The doctor came today. He told me I could go home for a short stay. It's not that I'm getting better. It's just that this may be my last chance. I think you know what I mean. Even so, I'm glad to be coming home. I've missed you terribly. I'm afraid, James. I'm afraid you don't really want me to come home. Whenever you come see me, I can tell how hard it is on you. I don't know if you hate me or pity me, or maybe I just disgust you. 
sorry about that. When I first learned that I was going to die, I just didn't want to accept it. I was so angry all the time, and I struck out at everyone I loved most. Especially you, James. That's why I understand if you do hate me. But I want you to know this, James. I'll always love you. Even though our life together had to end like this, I still wouldn't trade it for the world. We had some wonderful years together. <laughs> well, this letter has gone on too long, so I'll say goodbye. I told the nurse to give this to you after I'm gone. That means that as you read this, I'm already dead. I can't tell you to remember me. But I can't bear for you to forget me. These last few years since I became ill, I am so sorry for what I did to you, did to us. You've given me so much and I haven't been able to return a single thing. That's why I want you to live for yourself now. Do what's best for you, James. James, you made me happy. Now, this letter uses a combination of true and false rhetoric. Once again, there's the use of proof. In this situation, it's from Mary's own experiences with James. She does it because she's accepted her death. I mean, she does have a terminal disease after all. So as a final goodbye, she uses this letter as a means to logically convince her husband to stop feeling guilty over her death. Now, she uses false rhetoric, but in a situation like this, having a balance of the facts along with a strong emotional appeal isn't a bad thing, especially if there's a clear purpose for why it's being done. So there you have it. Even though there's so much more to take from Silent Hill 2's plot, enemies, and other underlying themes, there's plenty of rhetorical examples that also exist. From the differences between true and false rhetoric by doing a side-by-side -side comparison with Mary and Maria, to seeing how the game itself uses true rhetoric to determine our own ending based off our previous actions, to analyzing Mary's last words in her final letter to James, we see that rhetoric isn't something that's limited to something you read in a book, it's all around us. You can find it in our day-to-day -day interactions, in places where you probably wouldn't expect it. So knowing that, and once you get past pronouncing the word correctly, rhetoric isn't that terrifying at all. In fact, I'd like to say it's a beautiful thing. And that is no mystery. Good night, and good luck.